So I, I brought a few things, um, and you're going to be confused, and that's okay. We'll work through it together. But I'm, I like visual stuff. You know, I had the guitar and the metronome, and then, uh, so today I got some weights. <clears throat> so I got a bag, and you'll probably know where I'm going with this when I start, and you're like, we've heard this before, but there's a catch, so bear with me. So I got a bag here, okay? And I got some weights, and we're going to load up the bag. So these weights all mean something, right? Before you come to Christ, you've got sin in your life. Now, there's a really big weight underneath a lot of these smaller weights. That's going to be sin. I'll put that on last because it's going to break my backpack. So we'll put that on last. But then we have other things like once we're saved, we carry some baggage with us. Maybe we prayed for healing for someone and they passed and we have grief and we're struggling with that. I'm going to grunt a little bit, but that's all right. (laughs) Maybe we have church hurt. Maybe something happened in a church, and, and it's hard for us to connect to people. So that's more weight for our bag. Maybe we have pain from family that don't know Christ, and that still affects us. Even though we're saved, even though we're walking the walk, every week we're getting hit. We're getting hit. Maybe you're at a job where they don't respect you, and you have to put up with it because you need the paycheck. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction and you can't get away from it. This bag is going to get pretty heavy and I'm going to have to pick it up. But Maybe you're struggling with, maybe it's not an addiction, but maybe you're depressed or you have anxiety or you're worried about tomorrow. And all that adds up, right? So let's see if I can zip this bag up here. So here's our bag. Okay, let me get the big weight now that I told, uh, warned you about. Uh, thank you, Nick, for bringing this one. That's the weight of sin, okay? <laughs> there, there you go. I was going to do it first, but then I put the weights on top, and I don't want to move them twice. I'm not going to lie to you, okay? I'm a little, okay. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Let's open our scripture and read. Let's pray first. Lord, Thank you for giving me a word tonight and confirming it in multiple ways. And God, I just pray that this message is received and heard and that everyone can get something from it. Because I don't want to speak to just one person in the room, Lord. I want us all to grow. I want us all to learn. And even if it doesn't apply that we can use it, maybe we can share it with those around us who are going through things and need help and need salvation, maybe need redemption, maybe need set free. Amen. All right. So we're going to open scripture. We're going to read Hebrews 12, 1. See, I told you, you probably knew where this was going. Here we go. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance for the race marked out before us. Right here, Paul is saying, throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily entangles, and, the pers- and so you can run with perseverance. So I was going to put the backpack on, and then I loaded all the weight in and said, yeah, that's not happening. Uh, <laughs> I put it on to walk in, and my wife was laughing at me. I was, you know, it's 100 pounds in the, in, of the small weights, and then we got the 45-pounder. So it's a lot of weight, okay? So we're talking about tethered tonight. And you're like, but you just loaded a bag full of weight. I know. Bear with me. What does tethered mean Well, we're using definition number one. So tethered means to tie an animal normally, but we'll leave that out. So tie with a rope or chain so as to restrict movement. Here's a sentence for those that need a sentence. The horse has been tethered to a post. So here we go. We have our bag, right? And then we've got our tether. Okay, so we're going to clip our tether on here. And you'll see where I'm going with this. So as you notice, I'm currently tethered to the bag. Now, what what does that mean? That means I can go about this far until my pants are going to rip. If I could wear it, I wouldn't be able to go further. But I can go about that far. I can go backwards. I can walk all the way across here. But I can't move forward. So here is where we are. Here's where God wants us. So notice, I can't move further. Right? I'm tethered. And we'll get into what that means right now. So the reason I chose the word tethered is because it's different from being bound. 
There are things that bind us in life, but then there are things that we allow to bind us. When we are tethered, we have these moments where we come to the altar and we say, Lord, I surrender all for now. And we set it down. And then life happens and we fight with our spouse or work is hard or you know what, this week's just not as good as I think it should be. And so what do I do? I run back to that sin. I run back to that vice. I run back to that pain and I clip it back on. And then the next week, there's a song, and you're like, man, that resonates with me. Who the sun, yes, I picked the songs tonight in case you were wondering. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm gonna unclip, I'm set free. And God says, yes, you're set free, be free. And then we say, but, you know, I, I kind of like my Friday nights with my buddies that nobody at church knows about. I kind of like when I get to go gamble the paycheck before my wife sees. Sometimes we say, Lord, I'm done, I give it up, and then we clip that sin back onto us, and we are once again tethered to what we've once let go. So let's talk about the things that tether us. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So sin is our first tether, the big weight. Now we know we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and when we are saved, we have salvation in Christ, we know Jesus died for our sins, the blood is washed, right? Previous sins wiped away. Does that mean we don't sin anymore? No. Does that mean instantly when we have an addiction and we come to Christ, we, we can be set free? And if we give it up, God's like, yes, be set free. But as flesh, as Paul writes, we want to crawl back. We want to keep going back to the ways of the flesh. And so we are tethered to that bag that we hold. Even though God says, let it go, cast your cares, we always pick it back up. Sin is the first one. Sin is one of the hardest ones to break, not because we don't know what it is. We all know when we sin, we get conviction, we feel shame, you feel grief. Or before it happens, the Holy Spirit's telling you ahead of time, like, hey, this is a bad idea. And you're like, ah, but it feels good now. And we've all done stuff. We've all sinned. We've all told a white lie. We've all done other stuff. I don't know. You name it, I'm sure someone's done it, even as a Christian, because that's the point. We are not sanctified yet. We are in the process of sanctification. Here is the path we are on. We are moving to be like Jesus. We can't arrive. We'll get there later. But we've all sinned. We've all struggled. So we deal with sin. And it's in different amounts, right? When you've been saved a long time, when you've read your scripture, when you're studied up, when you're walking right, when you're in tune with the Spirit, it's a lot harder for you to fall into that temptation. But when you first get saved and you go back home and there's still beer in the fridge, it's hard to walk away. That's 40 bucks, or I don't know how much it costs, but whatever it is. <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, come on, I'm going to waste it, you know? And, and it's easy, especially when your home environment's different. If you think about uh, one spouse that gets saved when the other one's not saved, and some of you might be like that right now, that's hard to live like that. That's hard to walk the straight and narrow when the person you're living with, the person you love the most, isn't. So... Here we go, Romans 8, 12 through 14. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if you live through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. I think I read that already, but that's okay. <clears throat> Sometimes it's not sin that tethers us but it's pain and trauma. So I've got three tethers here, and you may not be able to see it, but I did plan ahead, okay? So we, that was one, so we've got two more. So sometimes it's pain and trauma. And this is different than sin. This is stuff that happens in your life that you can't control. This is either maybe uh, the devil does something, or maybe just life happens, and there's a car accident. If, if you're not aware, there was a car accident, I believe it was Friday, where a 16-year-old was killed on the way to school in Lakeland, in South Lakeland. And that is, I can't imagine, as a father, I can't imagine how, how that would be. 
And that is pain and grief that they have to carry. Sometimes we've been church hurt and decided that we want to attend, but that's the extent of our involvement. We've decided that we'll come to church and put on a smile, but we're not doing relationships because that's what hurt us in the past. It leaves us isolated and leaves us tethered so that we can't keep walking in the path God has for us. Maybe you're struggling with abuse, neglect, or heartbreak, or grief, or something you've held on to for so long, like unforgiveness, and it's hard to give it up. And you come for prayer, and you're like, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to give it up, God. I'm ready to give it up. And when God says, okay, let it go, you're like, but I've had this feeling for so long. If I let it go, that means I truly have to forgive. If I let it go, that means I can't complain that they passed. And it's hard to let it go. It can feel like God is miles away when you're in these moments, but David writes in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. So that was tether number two. Tether number three, here's where it gets a little harder. This might apply to, might not apply to you. I wrote some things down. Here we go, buckle up. Uh, it, maybe it's your own personal desires or your need for control or maybe your plan. We see things that we want to do our own way instead of surrendering to God's will. As Pastor Stan says a lot, we want to hurry God along. We know the promise, and we're in the in-between, and we want to jump to the end. We don't know his timing, so we want to rush through and make decisions for God instead of letting him be in control. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Okay, I'm going to list a few things. Maybe it doesn't apply to you, but if you bristle or are taken aback, you might want to check your heart. Maybe it applies. I ran it by my mom. She said, maybe not that one, but I kept it in here. So here we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, buckle up. I might get fired. Okay. Uh, here we go. Here's some things that might be holding you back. My time is too important to waste on volunteering. I can't do it like so-and-so, so I'm not even going to try to help. I don't have the patience to sit in prayer. That's not the way I would do it, so I'm not helping them anymore. This is the plan I have for my life. I don't care what they say. God can't use me like that. Here's some maybes. Maybe you've got a gift of the Spirit, but are lacking in the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe you're ready for God to use you, but only in the way that you're comfortable with. Maybe you pray in the spirit, but you gossip in English. That was the, okay, okay, okay. We're moving on. Keep going. Okay. Maybe you, don't, maybe you don't like a leader in the church, so you choose not to give or attend their class or don't come when they preach. Maybe you don't like the class, so you no longer show up for Sunday school. Maybe you don't like the way an event was run, so you give up on attending events altogether. Here's a thought. What if the service that we skipped out on because we disagreed with whatever was happening, or maybe it was a Sunday school we skipped out on, and someone comes that day who's going through something that you've already been through and you've overcome, but you're the only person that that applies to, and God's put them here on that day for you to speak to them, and you choose that morning, you know what? I'm not going anymore. And they don't get that healing, and they don't get that freedom, because they, you can walk with it. You can walk with them. And, and our own pride holds us back from saving somebody. Philippians 2.12, Dear friends, you always followed my instruction when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation for obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining the, like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain, that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. Okay, so that was tethers. Now let's talk about the consequences of being tethered. What are the consequences? Well, you can have stunted spiritual growth. As I said in the beginning, if this is my path, 
that God wants me to walk on, and I hold on to these things while I'm going here. I can stretch this, this paracord, and I can stretch my jeans a little bit, and maybe I can get a little further. I'm going to rip the pants. Okay. We're not going to go much further than that. I'll use my hand. I might be able to pull that. Look, I can pull the bag a little, right? But man, man, it's hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It's tough, okay? I can go. I'm grunting because it's tough. There's 150 pounds right there. But I'm, and God wants me to walk, right? God says, here you go. Here's the path. And we're like, but God, I'm, I'm holding on to this stuff. So you can have stunted spiritual growth when you hold on to the tethers. You see, this tether holds me from going any further. And this is where a lot of Christians find themselves. They want to go deeper with Christ. They want to be more like Christ. But they also want to hold on to the things of the world. Romans 12, 1 through 4. I got a lot of scripture. You know I like doing that. Here we go. Romans 12, 1 through 4. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Here we go. We're going to keep going. Yeah, verse 3. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each body has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into the full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Paul and Peter are saying, stop living like the world. Claim the freedom that Christ died on the cross for. And it's hard when we have the reminders. It's hard when there's a death that you pray for healing and you pray for healing and people in the church who mean well say they heard from the Lord and they said they're going to be healed. Trust in the Lord. And you know, sometimes we, we want to speak into someone's life and it feels good in the moment. But if it's not God, I would ask you to check yourself. Because I know with our family, with my cousin, there was a, a bunch of people that came and spoke and said, she's going to be healed, just keep trusting. And this is already when she couldn't even move out of bed. And they're saying, she's going to get up. And not two weeks later, she passed. And my other cousin is, is still struggling with it big time. Because he's saying, how can all these people who say they heard from God, how, can, how could they all be wrong? What happened? What if it was me? What if we didn't believe hard enough? And that's a, that is a tether that is holding them. Another consequence of being tethered is we miss the opportunity God gives us. God has a plan and a purpose for you, but if you're tethered, you're missing out. When Jesus talks to the rich young well, rewind, try that again. When Jesus talks to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, he asks Jesus, how can I get to heaven? Right? And Jesus says, well, you got to follow all these commandments. And he lists out some commandments. And he's like, well, I'm doing all that. I got it. I'm here. I'm following. And Jesus says, okay, you think you got it? Sell everything you have and follow me. He's like, whoa, <laughs> hang on. I don't know if I'm doing that. I have a lot of stuff. And so he misses the opportunity because he doesn't want to let go of the things of the world. And yeah, I'm saying money can be a tether too. Pastor Stan's preaching on that. Okay, there's a little shout out. Uh, <laughs> He says, Jesus is saying, get rid of your security blanket, get rid of your fallback, get rid of the thing that takes up the most time in your life and surrender completely. He couldn't do it, and he walked away. Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. So I, I had this sermon planned a few weeks ago. I, I was already... And I had to come up with the weights and the title, but I already had what I was writing about. And then Pastor Stan preaches this past Wednesday. After I finish my sermon, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to include this in here, and I'm going to tell the story. It's going to be great. Pastor Dan, Wednesday night with a youth, is like, tonight we're talking about the treasure that was buried in the man that bought the field. And I'm like, come on, man. I'm preaching on this. Uh, <laughs> 
And he, then he played a video, and it blew my mind, because I read the scripture, and I was going to talk about it, but now I'm going to tell you about the video that he played. There's a Christian company who uh, created like a short movie, right? And it was probably like five minutes long or so. And they follow this family in the UK, uh, and they're, they're living their life. They've got two kids. They've got a house. They've got cars. And there's an there's a anniversary, and the guy gets his wife a gift, and you're like, okay, this is interesting. And every time the, the morning comes, he's running on a trail, and you're like, okay. And then it clips to after the anniversary, after they've, you know, they're doing so well. They've got a lot of money. He's given gifts to his kids. He's given gifts to his wife. He's running on the trail, and he chooses to go a different route. And he starts to run, and he trips. He turns around, he uncovers this treasure. And he opens it up, and all you do is you see his face, and his face lights up, he starts smiling. So he closes it, he covers it back up. He runs to find the owner of the field. And this was God, right, because it's an analogy. And so he finds the owner of the field, and the owner, he says, how much do you want for the land? And the owner says, whatever you think it's worth, not a penny more, not a penny less, right? So the man goes back, and this is the short film they did, which is great for teaching what Jesus is meaning in this, okay? So he goes back to his family and he tells his wife, hey, I found this, we gotta, we gotta sell everything we have. And she's like, are you crazy? And he's like, no, trust me, it's worth it. You don't understand the treasure that I found. And so then they tell their kids, we gotta sell everything. And the kids are not quite on board. The daughter's like, you mean everything? The phone, the clothes, everything? She's like, they're like, everything. So then they clip to them selling all their jewelry, they sell their house, they sell their cars, they sell all their clothes, they have everything but the little boy has a toy that they let him keep. And they go and they find the man and they've got the check and they say, we're ready to buy the land. And he says, okay, well, how much do you think? And they hand him the check and he says, this is perfect. It's yours. And, and then the guy says, well, I feel bad. You know, I found something on there. And he said, do you not think I know what's in my field? You've paid the price. And the little kid says, no, not quite. And he hands him his little toy, the little four-year-old, says, now it's everything. Then the family runs back and they, they open the treasure. And the point of the story is for us to move forward, what is, what is God worth to us, right? In America, it's hard because we have stuff. We're surrounded by stuff. We're surrounded by advertisements. We're surrounded by commercials when we watch football. And we want to hold on to all these things in the world. But what is God worth? Isn't he worth everything? If we have the opportunity right now to sell everything we had and say, yes, I'm with Jesus right now, taken away, I'm doing it. See you later. I'm going with Jesus. That sounds awesome. And sometimes we don't act like that. We want to hold on to the things of the world. We want to hold on to our problems. We want to hold on to the money. We want to hold on to the things, the stuff we have. We want to be tethered to the world. When God says, come on, it's time to run the race. It's time to move forward. What is it worth? Okay. Now we're moving on to the last point, the last point of being tethered. So how to break free. Surrendering is the key to breaking free. When we surrender to Christ fully, we are letting go of the tether. We're saying, Lord, I choose you even in the dark moments when it's easy for me to fall back into my sin. I'm choosing you. Proverbs 28, 13, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. So that's, that's our first one, right? Let's see if I can move it again. Okay, it's not that bad by itself. That's our first one, right? We surrender, we say, Lord, I'm repenting of my sin. Does that mean we won't sin again? No, but when we sin, what are we gonna do? We're gonna repent. What are we also gonna do? Try not to sin. Maybe that's a step you might have to take because there's stuff we fall into and we're addicted to or we're, 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 we've done so much that we've convinced ourselves it's not sin, and when we check in that, when we grab that mirror, the magnifying glass sermon Pastor Stan preached about, but it was a mirror. When we look in that mirror and actually look at ourselves, we see, oh, that's something God wants me to get rid of. That is sin. I've been lying to myself this whole time. That's that tether that we get rid of. I'd cut the rope, but it's paracord and it's tough. So you're going to have to bear with me moving the weight. Okay. Maybe it's time for you to surrender pain or unforgiveness or surrender the grief. I've got good news for you tonight. Freedom with Christ is not temporary. Deliverance is not circumstantial. Jesus doesn't say, I set you free only because you do this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.16, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. 
For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So, if you're struggling and you're holding on to something, unforgiveness, grief, pain, church hurt, I'm telling you, tonight's the night. Because there's freedom right here, and all you've got to do, he's ready. It said it right there. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Guess what? The Spirit of the Lord's in the house. There is freedom. It's time for you to unclip and then throw it away and let it go and stop going back to it. It's time for you to find the freedom. Maybe it's not, maybe it's the pain and grief. Maybe it's not deliverance. So uh, Psalm 143, Psalm 147, three, he heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. God's not here just for freedom. He gives freedom freely, but he also died on the cross for our sins so that we can be healed. And that's not just physical healing. That's also emotional healing. If we have depression, if we have anxiety, if we're struggling, God's saying, hey, here, here I am. I'm ready. I'm going to pour it out. Will you let it go? Will you let it go? Will you stop running back? Maybe it's time for you to let go of control, let go of complaining, let go of your personal desire. Maybe it's not a let go, but it's surrendering your time, surrendering your goals, surrendering your plans. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Philippians 2, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort for his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equally with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Don't you feel like he's writing to America right there? When I read that, I'm, I'm like, I know they were dealing with it back then. But I feel like he's saying, hey, hey America, here it is. You want to know? How to, how to happen, how to work as a church. Well, you got to agree wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together. Don't be selfish and try and impress each other, but work together, love each other. And I read that and I'm like, man, that is the American church that needs to hear that right there. Because we struggle trying to impress. We want to show up in the nicest car. We want to show up in the nicest clothes. We want to show up knowing the newest music. We want to show up with the fanciest guitars. Maybe that's just me. Uh, <laughs> We want, to, we want to show up and show everybody how Christian we are, right? We want to impress with how much biblical knowledge I have over you. Well, guess what? If you're not filled with the Spirit, you're missing out. So if, if you need filled with the Spirit, maybe tonight's the night for you. Of course, I have a song that relates to this. Uh, Dakota and Hope aren't here tonight, but Dakota was injured, if you did not know. And through that, Casey had a blessing. Weird way to look at it, but hey, we'll take it. Uh, she got to attend the Brandon Lake concert. And there was an artist there that we've never, we've heard before, but we've never really listened to. His name is Benjamin William Hastings. And one of the songs she brought back is called Abandoned. And this song uses the second definition of abandoned, which means to be completely free from restraint. Now, this happened last Sunday, right? I'm telling you, I wrote the sermon already. So then she comes home, she's like, hey, listen to this song. And he, it's about abandoned, being completely free from restraint. And I'm like, Hello? That's crazy. So I'm going to read you some of the lyrics because I would, I would play it for you, but copyright law, it's pretty new. So we're, I'm going to read it so we don't get in trouble. <clears throat> Remember, it's the, it's the abandoned that means to be completely free from restraint. So it says, I'm completely, deeply, sold out, sincerely abandoned. I'm completely, freely, hands to the ceiling, enamored. My one life endeavor is to match your surrender to mirror not my will, but yours. Oh, I'm completely, deeply, don't care who sees me, abandoned. Man, I listen to that, I'm like, I'm fired up. That's me in worship, right? That's how I wanna be in worship. But that's not what, what it's, it's not just Sunday morning at 10.50 or Sunday night at 6 p.m. That's not our abandon. Our abandon's all the time. Our abandon's when we're at work and somebody's arguing with us, and we can snap back, but instead we choose love. Instead we say, you know what? Let's take a moment, let's take a pause. Maybe it's something else where, and we all have the weird friend that works with us, 
I know, everybody's got one, okay? And maybe no one wants to be near them. Maybe no one wants to sit by them. Don't care who sees me abandoned. Come on now, that's faith right there. I don't care what they say about me for going to talk to this person that looks weird or smells bad or has weird goat stink, you know? But I'm going next to them because I love them. I care about them. I don't care who sees me. I'm going. Okay. Now, I'll tell you a funny story, maybe. Yeah, we got time. Uh, when I was growing up in elementary school, I, first of all, I can talk to a wall. If you didn't know, if you weren't here, I'd still be preaching. Um, <laughs> just so you're aware. Uh, I'm pretty sure I talk to my wife when she's asleep because I just don't realize she's already fallen asleep. And, um, and I'm still talking. And she just drowns me out. But because of that, I'm pretty outgoing. I'd say I'm like outgoing, outgoing. I'm like double outgoing. So when I was in school growing up, there was a student who had special needs that no one wanted to sit next to. First of all, no one knew I was blind at the time too. So that's another point. So they put me in the front next to him is what I'm saying. So one, I I got to talk to him and I didn't even realize he was different. But two, I could see the board. So that was pretty cool. Uh, (laughs) But I remember his name was Justin. And I had him, I think it was first grade through fifth grade. I was with Justin. And it it didn't hit me until like fourth grade when Justin and I would sit together at lunch and all the other kids would say, why are you sitting with him? Justin's weird. I'm like, what do you mean Justin's weird? Justin's just a kid. Like, we're all weird. What do you mean? And I didn't realize Justin had, I think it was Asperger's. So it was a form of autism. And he had trouble communicating, but because I can talk to a wall, he would just sit there and let me talk to him. And then occasionally he would be like, yeah, and and that was it. And so I would talk to him and and we became good friends. And then we got on the chess team together, right? Yes, I know, nerd, I'm aware, it's okay. Chess team together and we we played on the chess team. And and it never dawned on me that that's why I didn't get invited to those kids' birthday parties. That's why I missed out when they would go to the movies, right? And that was the thing when I was in fifth grade, was going to the movies. remember telling my mom, we're going to see this movie. It's PG-13, so I'm going to need your ID to get in. She's like, no. Uh, (laughs) And so then I was like, we're going to see, uh, what was it, Toy Story 3. And she was like, okay, you can go see that. But I remember I wouldn't get invited, right? And I'd come back to school, and all these other kids would be talking about it. And I was on the A-team with them, the, the smart, cool kids, right? So I was with them in the, in the after school activity and they were always hanging out together and I was wondering why am I never with them? But you know what? I had a best friend in Justin, that kid was awesome. Cause I don't, it didn't bother me that I stood out for being next to someone who needed it. And I didn't even realize till I was older, my parents said, you know, they, the teachers would ask and say, can we put him next to Justin? And they would always say yes. And I had no idea, they didn't tell me that. But it didn't bother me at all. Because I didn't care who saw me. I cared that I wasn't involved and didn't get to go to certain things. But you know what? Because of that, I got to be different in middle school. I got to see kids that were struggling and say, hey, what's up, buddy? Can I help? And then when we were in, in the old, if you remember back in the old, old building in the annex, I think we called it way back, way back when with our youth group of like seven people and then built up to like 14 or something, but there were students there who would come who were grandsons of people here or brothers of people that still attend our church that were not saved and were a little weird and maybe smelled a little. But you know what? Because I had had the experience with Justin and I knew people just want to be loved. People just want to have, people want to feel like they belong. I was the first one. Let's go, man. Let's play some basketball with your sweaty hands. Come on now. We can do it couldn't hold on to the ball, but it didn't matter. He could dunk. So I was like, you're on my team, okay? I don't care who sees me abandoned. And then, of course, in the post-chorus, yes, we're still on the song. That's a long tangent. But he says, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. And then in case you were wondering what that means, here's the bridge. It says, the whole of my heart, the best of my soul, Each phase of my life, each breath in my lungs, consider it yours, Lord, consider it yours. The failures I hide, the victories I don't, the battles I fight, each crown that I hoard, consider it yours, consider it yours. 
This song encapsulates my sermon tonight, not only in worship, but in our life. We need to be completely, deeply, don't care who sees me, abandoned. We need to release control, release the pain and trauma, release our sins so that we can walk the path God's saying to walk. And when people come in that are dealing what, what, with what we dealt with in the past, we can say, listen, I've let it go. I've been set free. Now's your time. Here's how you do it. I've held on to this grief for so long. I've held on to the pain for so long that healing's not gonna come. And I didn't believe anymore, but you know what? I've overcome. And now I know God is my healer. God is my provider. God is my rock. So let me pray with you. Let me speak over your life. It doesn't matter if you can't, if you can't see it in your own life, right? That's not what it's about. If we pray for healing and healing doesn't come, it doesn't mean we stop praying for healing. We don't know God's will. We don't understand the master plan. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep believing because I know God is faithful and God will provide. So it's time to let go of that tether that's holding you back and believe for the future. God has a plan for us to be used in miraculous ways. But the thing to remember is that we never arrive. Once we cut the tethers, we get to run the race. Once we cut it, we're finally running. Paul reminds us in Philippians 3, 12 through 14. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Here we go. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Press on, forget the past, and look forward to what God has ahead. Press on, forget what didn't happen, forget what did happen, forget the church hurt, forget the relationship problem. Press on to the future of what God has for you. Sometimes we let that past, we let that problem, that struggle hold us back from meeting new people, from having new relationships, from being able to be there for a family that needs us because someone wasn't there for us. Well, guess what? Make the change. Be the change. If no one was there for you, that should be more reason that you can be there for someone else because you know what it's like. Okay, I'm done with my tangents. Would you stand?